Good morning to everybody again. Great to be back together today, as I've already said, and we're so thankful to have this opportunity to come together and worship God. We need to always appreciate and, and take seriously the blessing that we have in this country to be able to do this so openly. As I've indicated many times, it's not that way everywhere. So let's, let's be thankful and let's take advantage of the time always. We're coming toward the end of a series of lessons that I began uh, quite a number of weeks ago, talking about the devil's worst day. And I suspect that a whole lot of people have never really thought about the devil's worst day, the devil having a worse day or a bad day. And as we've gone through this particular series of studies, we've seen that he's had a whole lot of bad days. Again, I think a whole lot of people discount the devil largely in their mindset. They just kind of out of sight, out of mind, don't have to think about it. But he's real. He's just as real as is God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Hell is just as real a place as is heaven. And so we need to understand his reality and what he's about. But now again, he's had a lot of bad days. The, the Apostle Peter portrays him in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, as our adversary. So he says, be vigilant because your adversary, one who stands against you, an enemy, the devil, and so he identifies who that adversary is clearly, forthrightly, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then he says, and so here's the, here's the encouragement, resist him steadfast in the faith. So we can resist the devil if we're steadfast in the faith which God's word teaches us, believing in God, believing in Jesus, but not just an intellectual understanding and agreement, but a lifestyle of faithfulness, and we can beat the devil. Now, but the devil is our enemy. He is our mortal enemy, and he's seeking nothing less than our eternal condemnation and destruction in hell. And he is mean, he is deadly, and he is determined. We need to stop pushing him out of our mind and just discounting his existence as though we just, we don't think about him, it's not really that big a deal. It's a big deal. He's always there trying to work on us and pull us away. And, and if he can convince us that we can make excuses for not being faithful and dedicated to God openly and consistently, then he's already got us at least to some extent. So we need to stop trying to make excuses and explain things away for not following the devil. We need to understand he is there. He is real. Now, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, he who sins is of the devil. The idea there in the Greek, I believe the verbs are indicating he continues to live in sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested or brought to this earth that he might destroy the works of the devil. And then in verse 10, John goes on and he says, the children, of the, uh, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest or obvious, in other words, recognizable. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, and he, nor, nor is he who does not love his brother. So we need to understand that the devil is real. He really is there. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, he is identified as that serpent of old, that serpent of old, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, and he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. Now you think about that one verse of scripture gives us, gives us five different descriptions or identities of the devil. You think about that serpent of old, obviously refers back to, to, to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, where he appeared to Eve and Adam in the form of a serpent and lured them into temptation. The first two human beings that God created and put upon this earth, and he created them uniquely in that he created them with a soul in God's own image. And so that serpent of old, so that ought to automatically strike trepidation, trepidation in our mind saying, I, I need to be careful of that fella. I need to be careful of that being, old Satan himself. But then it goes on and it talks about, it identifies him as the devil, the devil. And so that identifies him as an accuser, a slanderer, uh, one who maligns, and also Satan, one who, that, that identifies him as our adversary, our enemy again. 
But notice also that it says he deceives the whole world. So he's a great deceiver, a great deceiver. And it's also portrayed there as a great dragon indicating power, power. But he does not have power over us unless we allow him to have that power. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus also identified him in a couple more ways. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So Jesus further identifies him as a murderer and also the father of all lies. Again, think about the power that Jesus or that, that Peter tries to portray in, ident in, in identifying the devil as like, being like that roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And we are the object of his seeking to devour. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, but I fear lest somehow, the apostle Paul writes, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's always out there working in insidious ways behind the scenes, trying to find an opening to get into our lives and lead us away from God and into sin. In verse 4, he goes on, the Apostle Paul, if he, if he who comes preaches Jesus, I'm sorry, preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, if you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted, Paul says, I'm concerned you may well put up with it. And so one of the avenues that the devil uses to try to get to us and lead us away from God's truth is to send false teachers our way, to send false teachers our way. Look at how, how Paul goes on in verses 13 through 15. Notice the devices he lays out that the devil uses. For such are false apostles, false teachers in other words, deceitful workers. He's not pulling any punches, is he? He's not, he's not trying to sugarcoat the description of the false teachers, is he? Transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Now notice, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now literally transforms himself into an angel of light? No. <clears throat> Tries to present the appearance of being an angel of light. Therefore, it is of no great thing if his ministers, his ministers, his agents. Now, James chapter 2 refers to some at least of those ministers as demons. But Anybody who would do the work of the devil in influencing other people into sin could be understood as a minister of, of, of the devil, an agent of him. It is therefore no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Ministers of righteousness. Interesting. Ministers who supposedly portray themselves as teaching God's word, the truth of God's word, but they're teaching it in error. False teachers, in other words. You see, the devil is very skillful and he's very powerful and he's very influential, but only if we let him be those things in our lives. The devil is pure evil, pure evil. Nothing neat about him, nothing cute about him, nothing good about him, pure evil. And he's relentless in his pursuit to your eternal destruction. But in spite of his determination and power, as we've seen, he's had a whole bunch of bad days already. And I want to get across today that you, you can give him another really bad day. A really bad day. <clears throat> the devil was cast out of heaven. We saw that in Revelation chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. He led a battle in heaven against God's angels and he lost badly and he was kicked out of heaven and down to this earth. This is where he makes war on those who are created in God's image and that's us, all of humanity. But he also makes war on the church particularly. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe, now why, why? You, 
the heavens and you would, you know, you would dwell in them. Why rejoice? Because the devil's gone out of there. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the, the, the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. He's only got a limited time here because this world only has a limited time. So he's here working furiously, devoted to try to lead as many of us who are created in God's image away from God and into eternal condemnation in hell. The devil has been effective, extremely effective. This world is his battleground and our soul's condemnation is his battle cry. Again, we, we need to not put him out of our mind because he's always there working to try to pull us away from God and into sin and thereby condemnation. He is like that roaring lion, always looking for a meal, and we're that meal that he's looking for. We need to understand our soul's destruction is his battle cry, and this is this world where we live is his battlefield. He's been effective in leading the world to be under his influence largely. All we have to do is look around us and see evil and wickedness everywhere. And perhaps more pronounced now than we have seen it in our entire lifetimes, maybe for generations. In verse 17 of Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 12, the dragon was enraged with the woman, and that goes back to an image of spiritual Israel in the first few verses of chapter 12. And the church today is spiritual Israel. He went to make war with the rest of, his, of her offspring. And who are the offspring of the woman that the devil is making war with today? Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Christians, the Lord's church, He's making war upon us today. And that's not over-dramatization. Over that is the absolute fact of the matter. So we always need to be on guard. Now, it's not the idea necessarily that they're going to go and attack the church everywhere all over the world in you know, some kind of sweeping movement, but every single individual Christian who makes up the church. He's after each one of us. A a after each one of us. Now, we should not love the world or the things of the world because the world is under his influence largely. Now, good people there, good Christians, the Lord's church, basically all over the world, but the devil has still been influential largely to pull the world from a general perspective under his sway. John the Apostle wrote that in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. We know that we are of God, but the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And then chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. So John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. For the, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes... The lust of uh, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so John is saying, because the devil has been so influential in leading the world in general, mankind on a broad-based scale, into unrighteousness, he says, don't let the world be your primary focus and driving force in your life. And that causes us, I'm afraid, some serious and painful self examination at times because we need to stop and ask ourselves am I am I really living for my Lord now the knee-jerk reaction by way of answering would say yes yes I am okay how am I doing that what am I doing how dedicated am I how committed am I how much time in my life am I giving to the Lord now, we're going to be studying about some of that this evening in a series that that I've begun last Sunday evening talking about careless attitudes in our spiritual lives. But how, how am I living? Am I making excuses for not giving to God the time or not giving the proper focus in my life to God and godliness and, and, and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? We need to stop and think. We need to do that self-examination on a regular basis because, again, there's only two ways to walk through life. There is no middle, middle of the road. 
It's either I'm walking with God or I'm walking away from God, and that means I'm walking with the devil. He's having his way with me. I'm giving in to his influence. How appropriate is the description? Yeah, again, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, the world is full of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. So, so John says, don't let the focus on your focus on the world be the driving force, the most important, the primary force in your life. But think about other descriptions of the world. Galatians 1 verse 4, for example, the Apostle Paul wrote, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our, of God, of our God and Father. This present evil age. Do you think there has ever been a generation in the history of mankind that could not be described by that particular phrase, this present evil age. And again, right now, in the world, in our nation, how could we not see that that is an apt, absolutely appropriate description, this present evil age? Or how about another one? Philippians 2 and verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked, in the midst where we live, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, we're supposed to be different from the world. We're supposed to be standouts, basically, not to draw glory to ourselves, but to glorify God, to glorify God. We don't want to fall into the depravity of the general scene of the world that is under the sway of the wicked one. We don't want to fit into comfortably this present evil age or this crooked and perverse generation. We don't want to be a part of that. Remember what it was like, and this should always be a warning sign to us. You know, you're driving down the road and you're driving down a highway and you're coming to a railroad crossing. And some of those may have a blinking and maybe even loudly bla blaring warning light and signal, a train's coming, it's not very far away. Well, you, you, what do we do? We stop. We let that train go by because we understand that's danger if we get caught in the tracks when that train's coming across the road. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, what was it like then? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. We don't want to be a part of that in our lives today. We don't want God to be sorry that we, he made us. We don't want to live in such a way that we bring grief to his heart. Well, the devil's powerful. He's influential, extremely influential. And so many people, they just, they don't have a guard up, basically, against him. They just let him into their lives. They let him influence their thinking and the direction they take in life. But here's the thing. Now we saw the devil had, we already talked about it, Revelation chapter 12, perhaps his worst day to this point in time was when he led that rebellion against God in heaven and lost badly. And he and his angels were cast out and down to the earth. But that did not stop him. How could he, how could he get back at God? Track, uh, he, he could attack the humanity that God created in that unique way. He created us in his own image. He created us to be with him forever. And so if the devil can pull us away from God, he can hurt God. That's probably this, in his mind. That's his mindset. And so he quickly attacked Adam and Eve in the garden and led them into sin. He must have rejoiced over that. But God stepped in, and in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, he said, uh-uh, I'm going to send a Savior into the world. 
Well, then we look at Genesis chapter 6. And again, he must have thought, I got him now because almost every single human being on the face of the earth is sinful, is wicked, only wicked continually. Every thought and intent of his heart is only wicked continually. And God is grieved over having made them. But God said, wait a minute. There's one man who's righteous, and that's Noah. And through him and his family, I'm going to give him humanity another chance. Then we talked about how God allowed him to work on Job with some limitations, but Job never, never turned away from God. And then Jesus came into the world. And he thought, if I can kill the Savior. And so he used Herod as one of his ministers or agents. He was going to kill all the newborn children in that area up to about two years of age, but God had sent an angel and told Joseph, take care your family flee to to, to, to Egypt until Herod dies. And then Jesus began his public ministry. The devil tried to attack him directly in the wilderness after he had fasted for 40 days. He threw temptation after temptation against him, but Jesus stood tall, resisting him, refuting him with scripture every time. That's why we need to be in God's word regularly. But then... The devil was successful in turning most of those people, the Jewish nation, who supposedly were ready for the coming Savior. They had the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah to come, but he led them for the most part to reject Jesus and even influence the Jewish leadership to instigate his crucifixion on the cross. And when Jesus died on that cross, how the devil must have jumped up and down and said, I have done it. I beat God. I killed the Savior. But then three days later, his exultation made his face drop because God raised him from the dead. You can deal the devil another really bad day. We remember what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9. Be vigilant, resist the devil. He's your adversary. He's like a roaring lion walking around seeking whom he may devour. But Peter said, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. God gave us his word to guide us to victory over the devil. Literally, we can think of it that way. And so we can resist the devil. We can stand fast in the faith. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, at the end of that that incredible chapter on the resurrection, both the Lord's resurrection and our ultimate resurrection if we're walking with him into eternity. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. And then further, Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus your Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with all thanksgiving. Because these are the, this is the way of righteousness. This is the way of godliness. This is the way of faithfulness to God. This is the way to resist the devil effectively and powerfully. The faith. Stand strong in the faith. Resist him in the faith. And the faith is simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's word. Philippians 1 and verse 27 Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Faith is used in at least three different ways in the New Testament scriptures. Faith, that's my faith, my personal belief in God, in Jesus. The faith, that's the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then faithfulness. That is how I live consistently 
obediently according to the faith, the word of God, his teachings, the gospel. And so striving together for the faith of the gospel. We look a little bit further in Colossians 1 and verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Remember the apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. How do we resist the devil? We stand fast in the faith. We live by God's teachings continually. The gospel message of salvation through Jesus Christ. You come into the faith as you obey the gospel of Christ. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus told the apostles as he was ready to ascend back to heaven, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature or to all creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he who does not believe shall be condemned. You overcome the devil by being strong in the Lord. How can we be strong in the Lord? We stand in steadfast in the faith. We live by his teachings. Ephesians 6 and verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In the power of his might. And you come into Christ in exactly the same way as you come into the faith. And that's as you're baptized into Christ. Romans 6, beginning with verse 3. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What a great imagery and comparison to the literal death on the cross of our Lord, burial in that tomb, and then raised up, risen, victorious over death. Paul says, as you are baptized, you come into Christ. And you're baptized into his death. And as he was buried in that tomb, literally, you're buried. And that's what baptism is, a total immersion, a burial in the waters. And the blood that he shed on the cross cleanses us of the guilt of our sins. And then, just as he came forth, risen from that tomb, alive, physically, we come up out of that water having been washed clean of the guilt of all of our sins by the blood of Christ. We come up risen from death due to sin because our sins have been forgiven, cleansed, washed away, and we are now alive in Christ. We begin a new life in him. Galatians 3 and verse 27 also says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And those two verses, Romans 6 and verse 3, Galatians 3 and verse 27, are the only verses in the entire New Testament scriptures that have that phrase, into Christ, preceded by the means of coming into Christ. And both of them say, baptized into Christ. Can you resist the devil? Yes. Yes, effectively, powerfully. James says, therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Yes, we can resist the devil. You can give him another bad day, a really bad day from your personal perspective as you come to Christ, as you surrender to him in baptism for the remission of your sins. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, Paul wrote, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What does that word mean, to reconcile or reconciliation? It means to be brought back into a right relationship with God. He created us in that right relationship, but when we allowed sin to enter into our lives, we need to be reconciled. He sent his son with the gospel message of forgiveness and salvation and eternal life, and through that message, we can be reconciled to God. Through that, through our Savior, we can be reconciled to God. So he has given us, Paul says, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation, which is the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19. When you become a Christian, when you are baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, you overcome the devil. You overcome him. 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. John says, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And that's why they're strong. And that you, have over, you have overcome the wicked one. You can overcome the wicked one. On Pentecost, when some of the Jews present heard Peter's sermon about the Savior, they said, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. And Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you become a Christian, the devil loses his battle for your soul. He's lost. He no longer has influence over your life because you've become a Christian and you're walking in Christianity. You're walking in the Lord. And that day, you will have dealt the devil another really bad day. Do you need to come at this time? Do you need to change your life? Do you need to study some more about it? We'd love to help you with that if you just ask us. Do you need the prayers of the church for guidance, for forgiveness perhaps? Maybe you've slipped away after having come to the Lord. We'd love to pray with you if you just step forward and let us know or talk with us privately. If you need to take that step and come into Christ through baptism, change your life, be born again, we'd love to help you with that this morning as we stand together and sing.